This is a recording of the class about writing papers. So I am going to share, first of all, we start with the paper rubric and the, you know, the, well, I guess you call them rubrics, whatever. Um, it's a list of criteria and then we'll go through papers and then you can see how it is those criteria fit with a paper. So first of all, in the first paragraph, you need a thesis. What am I going to say? And so the quality of the thesis. Um, uh, so it relates to the class material you're able to analyze and synthesize the material. And then it's clear what you wanna say and it's valuable, all right? So um, if your thesis was, women in Bangladesh are oppressed because they have to marry early. Well, I mean, that's true, but that's not a whole paper, right? It would, you know, a bigger thesis would be uh, women are oppressed and it starts with marrying early because marrying early leads almost always to having children, to not being able to get an education to, right? So the thesis would, that's more complex. Um, but in and of itself, just that one thing to try and write a paper related to one thing is less complex than if you start out with a more complex thesis. So we're going to be talking about that clarity of the thesis, the quality and the value, right? So make sure you write about something that you think is very important. So this paper, I want you to write about what you anticipate you might want to do as a professional. You don't have to put yourself in a box and make yourself do it. What it is, is you're trying to get a sense. And so what if I wanted to do that? What, what obstacles are there because of patriarchy, right? So you want to study which obstacles are a function of patriarchy. You might want to add that when you add male domination to class, it's also harder if you're from the lower class. I don't know if in your countries, your ethnicity becomes a problem. I don't know if that's lo the location where you live. But it would start out with sexism and then it would add intersectionality, it would add other issues that compound the difficulty, right? Um, if you live in a place, if women live in a place where they have no access to, to learning English, that would be a huge problem. So anyway, everything's interconnected. And um, so that's kind of in the back of your mind. I want you to, before you even start sitting down to write, you've got a, a you understand how everything's interconnected, right? And you understand how you're more passionate about some things than other things. And you might also want to include something about the gods. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't taught them before, so I'm not sure how they would get um, integrated, but my students can come up with things that I haven't thought of. So if you do, that's great. Especially some of you who have friends uh, who you've already identified with the gods or your fathers or whatever, you might be able to bring in something where um, this particular profession, I mean, if your father is in construction and you happen to know that they never let women in construction, that would sort of do it. Um, so anyway, we'll just keep thinking about that. 
the arguments, right? So is you're going to argue for something, you're going to defend a conclusion and it's, um, you have to have premises, okay? So the first paper is about whether, about women in psychology, okay? And it starts out saying, actually women are 61% of the psychologists are women. So it looks like sexism is not a problem. But if you look deeper, there, there are many problems that show it's still sexist. They have more loans. At, they, have, they go into debt more. They get paid less once they get a job. They don't get promoted. They don't get, okay. So, so there's subtle ways, right? So your, um, your thesis could be, it looks like women are equals, but this paper is going to explain that that's not true. <laughs> and so the premises are reasonable. Uh, they're based on the facts. Either your claims are uncontroversial, everyone would agree to this, um, or you've quoted an authority, right? And so I, this, the papers that I got in, you need a footnote on every sentence or every paragraph at least where you're referring to something you read and you're either literally quoting or you're paraphrasing. And the students, not very many of them really did that. So I'm gonna hold your feet to the fire on that because it has to be clear to the reader when you are just giving your opinion and when it's based on research by a legitimate scholar, institution, publication, press, you know, you've got to show that that you're not just spouting off, um, especially in this day of fake news and all this stuff. It really is important to make sure every sentence in your paper is either a reasonable inference or based on unquestioning real, real facts, right? Facts, okay. So you have your premises, then you draw your inferences. Are they logical, right? Does it naturally follow from all these facts? Therefore, even though it seems women aren't uh, discriminated against, as a matter of fact, they are, because I've given you all this data, right? Okay, the textual references. This is direct or indirect, right? And um, so it shows that you understand what it is you read. And I'm not gonna be reading all of your references. I'm not gonna read any references, I don't think, I might. But you have to make sure you understand it and you're quoting from it in a way that's fair to what you read. Um, the references are long enough so that the reader knows how that connects to the point you're making, but they're not too long. Sometimes students start quoting too much and you lose the train of the argument. Like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> and then you explain the connection between the point you make and the quote and you incorporate it. So, um, so I'll hopefully give you some examples while we're going through the papers. Make sure you cite both your direct quotes and your paraphrasing. Um, and when it's online, it might be, I don't not, I hope that you can do page numbers. If it's a JSTOR or whatever, there definitely are page numbers. So I think, I think that's not a problem. Um, your examples. So you give examples that are long enough to show the connection. Uh, you describe the connection. You don't have too long of an example. You don't have too many examples, too few examples. 
and you do support your thesis, right? Um, okay. The counter argument is usually just, usually on these papers, it's not hard, you know? Patriarchy has established that women's place is in the home and you can tell because of the way the laws are, whatever. So that's usually the point of view that you're arguing against. So that's not um, usually too difficult. Um, so each paragraph has a topic. This is where I'm not sure if all your teachers feel this way, but I really like the first sentence to tell me what you're gonna, what the point you're gonna make in this paragraph. And then I can look at that sentence and look back at the thesis and know right away what the structure of the paper is. Um, Okay, the parts of a paragraph fit into the paragraph. They're all connected to the topic. And then each paragraph is linked together. Um, then there's the grammar stuff. And um, that's, that's an issue. Um, again, I have to keep pushing you to get your grammar better. Just takes practice. Um, then some papers are more complex than others. Some are more complete, you support what you said, and some are more creative. Like you've put stuff together in a way that um, even your references didn't put it together that way. So you've added something to the, the body of knowledge in the field. And then it applies, okay, it applies to current events. Um, and then I have these criteria. It shows that you are intellectually honest, you're committed to truth, you're fair to opposing points of view, patient with complexity and ambiguity. So these aren't super issues on this particular paper, but they're always, you know, important in the back of your mind. Then there's this idea of the union between some idea of reasoning, right? So reasoning includes social science research, science research, uh, just plain old logic, reasoning. And then some idea of the good life. And this is where many of you have a situation where what people think your religion thinks is a good life for women is different from what you think is a good life for women or what you think your religion thinks. But that doesn't have to be the main topic of your paper at all. Um, you might, you might want to bring in something like the reason why psychology is less gendered than other um, disciplines is because it originated in the West and it originated under these claims of equality. It's a more recent kind of discipline. So it should be less sexist. It's, it is plenty sexist, but there's, it's less so than other um, jobs like um, maybe construction, or architecture. Like, I'm not quite sure if architecture is how gendered it is. I'd be curious. But anyway, so things like that. So now let's go to an example of a paper. Um, let me go to this one. All right, so this is the psychology. Okay, so let's look at the title of it. So it's about disparities women confront in the field of psychology. All right. Now, again, that's a good title and the title matters. So the question is, is that what the paper shows, right? Okay. Psychology, the study of mind and behavior was once male dominated, but today females are dominating, right? In her article. And so, when she says females are dominating, she needs to support that, right? You gotta give me data. 
So here it is. Okay, women make up 76% of new psychology doctorates, 84 of early career, 53 of the workforce, right? Okay, so females are dominating, but even though they have surpassed men in numbers, they're still victims of patriarchy. According to a new, again, here we go, data. According to a new report, they face inequality in money, power, and status, right? So just think they got, so her paper is gonna have to start out with money, then power, then status, okay? The essay is going to deal with the disparities in educational preparation, employment, okay, that's the money, professional status, and po positions in leadership, okay? Well, she could have said, she could have said money, status, and power would have, would have been better, right? Employment is the money, uh, leadership is the power and then status, right? So those are the kinds of things to keep in mind. You're just gonna have this paper that just lays it out. In, in that way, it's like a machine. Make sure each of the pieces of the machine actually fits together. Um, all right, and then the cause would be patriarchy, okay? So she's gotta establish that that's the cause. On the one hand, in spite of the overall patriarchal nature of society, it seems that the field has achieved equality. More women than men are awarded doctoral degrees. Um, relatively high, okay. And she's already, so she's already quoted from the survey, so she doesn't have to do it again. She can just refer to it. Um, and then it's, in, uh, let's see, uh, regardless of race and ethnicity. So again, she's ruling out other kinds of discrimination because she wants to show that it's patriarchy that's the problem. If you look deeper, women are at a disadvantage. Okay, so it's not race or ethnicity, it's women, women being a woman. While taking classes and getting their degrees, women finish with more debt. Again, according to a survey, right? Whenever she makes a claim, then it's, here's the piece of data. Um, all right, that means they graduate with 4,500 more student debt. Okay, theoretically, that might be be justifiable if they were paid more than men, right? So even if you want to grant this, it would be um, if, like, but if they were paid more, then men would would <laughs> would complain, right? That this is unfair. But the trouble is that the injustice is. The reverse is true, right? As a matter of fact, they average, they receive less money than men in their job, right? So they they leave with more debt and they get paid less, okay? So even though the numbers appear to have reached equality, the difference in debt and salaries indicates the continued influence of patriarchy, not uh, discrimination based on ethnicity or other factors, it's women. Okay, if we look into the gender patterns in employment, here's another thing that's, that's based on gender. More men are employed full-time, whereas more females are part-time. Um, so here again, she gives you the data. Here it is, um, 67, right? If a woman wants to work after marriage, it's hard for her to get or maintain full-time work. The reason behind, most likely, okay, she doesn't have the data for this, but she just says most likely 
The reason is that married women, especially when they have children, are expected to take greater responsibility. At least that's true in patriarchal societies. So um, again, she doesn't have to get uh, a piece of research on that. That's what patriarchy is, <laughs> sort of by definition, part of patriarchy. Um, another thing, professional women work an average of 10 hours less per week compared to professional men. Um, this could explain some of the salary differences, right? Generally, psychology faculty earn less than faculty. Okay, here's another problem. And I, and um, this really could be another paragraph, okay? This could be a different paragraph that, um, uh, let's see, another issue is the difference between faculty in social science disciplines and faculty in STEM related disciplines, right? So in general, faculty in social science earn less. Plus in general, there are more women in social science at, compared to STEM, right? Um, so the salary gets pulled down even more if you compare with that of women in STEM related fields. Um, okay, examining employment patterns more closely, women are getting paid. Okay, so I think you would want a separate paragraph on this STEM issue because that's, that's a big issue all over the place in all sectors of society, okay? because they choose to be part-time, they work fewer hours, they disproportionately choose a field where the pay is lower, and these patterns will persist as long as patriarchy has a strong influence in the formation of societies, okay? Um, all right, does everybody, okay, so I hope you understand that, that, um, there could have been one more sentence here or something just confirming that women um, are not as prominent in STEM disciplines and those tend to pay more. Okay. Let's see, women are also underrepresented, uh, un underrepresented in professional activities and academics. So this would be the status and the power stuff, right? And I think um, women in psychology, you need to say there. Um, according to a report, then once again, she comes right back with the data. A percentage of male faculty in the position of professor, that's the status thing, okay? Uh, compared to female. Um, uh, women made up 50%. Okay, here's another thing. The American Psycholo Psychological Association, um, they hold just over half of the governance positions. All right, so they make up over half of the members and over half of the APA governance. However, a very small number of percentage of women have been presidents, right? So the fact that you can just join the APA by paying your dues, <laughs> that's but no big deal, right? But who gets promoted to presidents? Um, they're not given positions of authority, right? Um, all right, so I would say, so that's a, a power position, president. Further, men have been the recipients of a disproportionate percent of honors. That's the status. So they received 10 out of 27 awards. Um, okay, three out of nine of the winners, blah, blah, in 2019. So you could have one more sentence that says, even today, right, without factoring in the averages that would go in the past, even today in 2019, 
they're not proportionately uh, given the same status. Um, okay. All right, then the next point, um, I think this could even uh, be another paragraph because one paragraph is they don't have as much power, they don't have as much status. Then the next point is it can lead to a downward spiral, right? When they realize that they'll have to expect to work more and be rewarded less, they're less motivated to aspire to do what's necessary and to engage in the demanding level of activities. Patriarchy again influences these decisions. Um, it indicates the conspicuous presence of patriarchy. Okay. Um, all right. Does that make sense that 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 could that sh I think that should be another paragraph because there's one thing about what the data is. It's another thing about what the, the effects of that would be in terms of women making choices. It doesn't mean they're necessarily going to say, oh, I'm going to write that wrong. <laughs> no, you know. Um, OK, then the next. In conclusion, women are overrepresented in educational settings and underrepresented in engagement, salaries, professional activities, and leadership. Um, even though overrepresentation in education is not necessarily bad, we need to be concerned about the disparities in the aspects of their professional lives. If ignored, even women who are talented and passionate might opt out for other fields. This would be a disaster because there's a great need for psychologists. Um, all right, and this is important. So, um, the, okay, quote, this is important, right? There seems to be an ongoing pattern of violence, bullying, and sexual harassment in schools. Thus, there's an increasing need for more psychologists. Um, the most talented people can help people get the most out of their lives by keeping them free from depression and other mental health issues. Discouraging 50% of those would deprive many people of the services they need. So on my view, women should be given the same treatment as men. They should be considered as important as the women working in other STEM-related disciplines. Um, I think that um, I think it would be good in right here, uh, right here after this one, to say um, women. Okay, so you've just said it can lead to a downward spiral when women look at the data; they're less motivated. Okay, this would be a disaster because. Um, you start here. This would be a disaster because there's a need. So this, this paragraph here would go, um, this would be a disaster, blah, blah. The most talented people can help people out earlier in their lives, discouraging them, okay? So right there is a paragraph that I think should go up here. And then in conclusion, right? Women are, um, you could have the first sentence be, there's a great need for good women psychologists as well as good men psychologists. But the fact that women, blah, 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 blah. So women should be given the same treatment as men, should also be considered as important as the women working in other fields. Um, and here she has, I want you to have at least three sources. Um, you can take one of your sources from one of these papers you read, but no more than one. You can also use the source from the readings in our book. But, again, but I want you to find at least two sources on your own, okay? So you can always have more than one. 
um, she has, you know, more than three. So you could have one from one of these sites from the students last year, uh, one or more reference to uh, one of the books you read before, but then at least two on your own that you've gone looking just because you need to know for your own purposes about how to look stuff up and finding out exactly what it is you want to know about and what will support your thesis. Okay, so let me take a break here and see, do you have any questions? Let me just, okay, yeah, go ahead. Professor, so we don't need to do our own research, right, for the paper, and we can just use other people research to support our thesis in the paper. Okay. Well, you have to have your own thesis, right? What did, what was the question again? Uh, we don't need to do our own research, like we searching the data by ourselves and we can just use other people research data to support our thesis. No, you have to come up with at least two of your own, right? So we are doing our own survey you can use one reference from one of the other students' papers, right? Untari, are you there? Yes, professor. You do need to do your own research. No, I, I mean how, the data. Yeah. I don't know what that means. We don't need to do our own research for the paper and oh, we just use I mean, other people's research to support our thesis. I don't know what oh, that means. Well, I think I put it wrong. Like, I mean, we, do, we don't need to do our own survey, right? Okay. Okay, you have to have at least three references, right? Yes. That's in the requirement. At least three, at least three. You could, uh, you could take one from one of the papers, right? You could, okay, say you wanted to do your paper on psychology. Well, you know, if, if there was a reference in the paper I just showed you that fits exactly what, with what you want to say in your thesis, you can use one, right? But then you have to go find more. Ah, yes, Professor, I got, I got it. Okay, then you can, if you want more than, you know, if you want to use the, God, the goddesses book, that's a fourth reference. If you wanted to use more than one lifted from another student, that would be a fifth one. I just definitely want you to have at least two that you went and hunted down on your own, okay? Okay, Professor. Yeah, well, that's important to clarify, really. If I didn't make that clear, it's really important. Um, okay, yeah, you have to have, even if you come up with your, your data, well, even if you come up with finding your own article that has the data you need, you also have to add uh, others' opinion, yeah, to increase the reliability. So you have to have at least three <laughs> references, but that's at least. Um, and I did write in one of those posts that if you do the bare minimum, that's a B minus. And that's fine, you know, like that's an 82 or something. And that's, I'm perfectly happy with that. When I tell you the bare minimum, that's not an A. <laughs> but um, I just want you to pace yourselves and figure out, you know, how you want to, um, you know, fit this class into all your other classes. That's, that's it. Okay, somebody else have a question?
So let's go back to, um, to that rubric again and see how this paper, see what I'm thinking about when she's, you know, giving her, when I'm reading the paper. So disparities in the, for, against women in the field of psychology, right? So the paper, would you say it shows that she understands the course material about patriarchy, the theme of patriarchy, that it's a valuable thesis and that it's clear. You know, she says at the beginning what she's going to talk about, and then she talks about it. Then with her arguments, she has reasonable claims. They're either based on facts or she has these assumptions. So in a patriarchy, because it's a patriarchy, you can assume that most people think women's role is to be a wife and mother. That's an uncontroversial assumption, right? I don't think she needed a reference for that. But whenever she, you know, made a claim, what the authorities in the field accept, she really supported whatever needed to be supported. <clears throat> another thing, another inference she made that was logical was that when women find out it's going to be harder every step of the way, that could lead to a downward spiral for this or that reason. So not everything has to be researched, right? Because you can't necessarily get data on everything, but it's reasonable, right? And she's not saying it will happen. She says it could happen. And then she says, given this information about how much bullying there is and the research that says we're going to need more psychologists, there's going to be a need. And so if women do get discouraged, that is particularly damaging because when, when young people have problems in high school, if they aren't addressed, that cripples them for the whole future of their life. So she can make these inferences that are logical, right? And the data supports them indirectly. You can make an inference, right? You can, so the assumption about patriarchy, then there's this inference that given this, they, it might be, a, it's reasonable to think it'd be a downward spiral. Given the facts that the need will be great and that intervening when people are young can make a, such a huge difference to the whole rest of their life, this is really a problem, right? So it's a combination of uh, arguments based on claims, based on research, drawing inferences, implications. Um, the inferences are not 100% certain, but they're reasonable, they're logical, they're clearly stated, right? Um, and the, the way all the parts fit into a whole, right? It's the fact that there's a need, the fact that it's not STEM, the fact that women get discouraged from STEM, the fact that they decide to go to grad school, the fact they end up with more debt, the fact that they get a worse job, the fact that they work part-time. So it, the, everything is connected in all the different phases of their lives, right? All the way to retirement or the peak of their careers, whether they get to be the president, whether they get the award, the big awards, um, and then whether troubled junior and senior high, high students get their needs met so that they can have a flourishing life. So all this stuff fits together. The textual references are good. Um, they show that she, that she understands what she read in the, re, in the references. They're long enough to connect the references to her argument. They're not too long. 
she just pretty much gives you the piece of data that supports the claim. Um, she explains the connection and she incorporates it into the paper. And she has all her citations in order there, okay? Okay, her examples, they're long enough to show the connection. She's described them clearly. There's not too many or too few. So I think, except for those couple little places where I think she could have changed her paragraphing a bit, um, everything is supported um, and that all fits together. The counter argument in this case, the counter argument is that it appears that there's equity because more women than men are going into the field, blah, blah. That's the counter argument. But she responds to that and she shows that that argument is wrong. There's still discrimination. Then there's the paragraphing. That's where I had some suggestions there with a couple of switches in the paragraphs. Then there's the grammar. Her grammar is good. Then there's how complex the thesis is. I think it's complex. She makes a lot of points. How complete it is. She has, you know, all the different aspects of life, all the different people's lives that are affected. And it's creative, right? So when she says ab about the downward spiral, that's complete creativity on her part. And it's legitimate. It's a good inference. It's her own inference. And it's an important inference. Uh, it definitely applies to things. Um, if coming from a developing country, you could make the further point that especially in developing countries where patriarchy is more powerful, where uh, students who want to achieve have more obstacles, they have to be more determined, they can't lose heart in junior high and senior high, especially in developing countries, these disparities are particularly important. She could have added that. Um, so anything, you might wanna think about that in your paper just think about, is this particularly important in a developing country like my country? And that would be, that might not be a, you might be able to get research on that, the difference between developing developed countries, but you might just want to make that inference. It's a logical inference. Um, not everything has to be supported with data as long as it's reasonable. Um, okay, and here she shows that she's intellectually honest, she's committed to truth, she's fair to the opposing point of view, she's patient with the complexity, right? She understands this is complex, and she tolerates reasoned dissent, but in this case, the dissent is not very well reasoned, <laughs> so she shows why it's not. Um, okay, and then she has a view of what it means to flourish, right? And she thinks human beings should flourish, uh, develop themselves as people. And she doesn't bring in religion, whether religion is a positive or negative influence on this. She just assumes that you are either a religious humanist, that you're some kind of a spiritual humanist, right? That's sort of built into the paper. Um, and she uses different kinds of reasoning, right? She uses data collecting uh, as well as logical inference. Um, all right, so let me take a pause for a minute. Um, any other questions? Okay, let's go to another paper. Uh, let's start here. Okay. Okay. 
the culture, society, and religion dominate all the gender norms happening in Bangladesh. Okay, so this isn't the way an English, a native English speaking person would say it, right? So you'd say, um, so gender norms in Bangladesh affect all aspects of the culture. That would probably be enough. <laughs> um, let's see, then the next view. Um, okay, women born in Bangladesh or in South A the South Asian region. Um, okay, so here again, this is not the way an English speaking person would say it. Um, okay, so it would be something like gender norms control, uh, gender norms are pervasive in all aspects of Bangladeshi culture. Women experience gender discrimination at every phase of their life, right? Something like that. To survive in this society, okay. Women are asked to follow the rules and the customs, and when they break them, they are socially marginalized, right? So again, she becomes the victim of social point of view badly. That's not the way an English speaking person would say it. And so um, again, this is just practice for you. So in her case, I would rewrite it, right? This, this, these were the papers handed to me as is. And the students could have worked with me. Um, and some did and some didn't. Um, they just ran out of time. But so this would get a lower grade just because of the English. Um, but again, that's it's a writing seminar. So you just keep working on it. Um, so professor. Yeah. So the victimization part is more general, I think. So we can be more precise, like gender gap, male domination, or no access to large English, it can be more precise. Am I, am I right? Ahida, maybe you should type it in. It's okay to type it in anyway, because then everyone can get the question. Um, let me. Professor, I am saying that victimization or this more general word, so we can make it more precise, like male domination or ethnicity problems or no access to Latin English. Right. Well, okay. Depends upon what you're talking about, right? Okay. Um. So in this paper. We don't, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know what exactly her paper is going to be about. So that's a problem too, right? So I think your, um, your titles need to be more specific than that. Um, okay. All right. Every woman has their own struggle story behind their success. That's, you know, the, the, her English is not the way a native speaker would write. Um, some brutality of men towards women gets exposed sometimes. Um, then we start questioning ourselves, where did humanity, our humanity go? Okay. Many women also take part in performing these brutal tasks. Maybe those humane facts do not shake their inhumane facts, do not shake their minds at all. However, this paper is going to focus on how dependent behavior of women develops, then how some women become male identified women, and the struggle 
and to some extent the consequences. Okay, so um, the struggle against patriarchy and the consequences of breaking. Okay, so I mean, what I hope you understand this that this is not clear, right? It needs to be a lot clearer. So, um, so uh, pay, male domination is the prevailing norm in Southeast Asia. This paper is going to, dis to discuss four aspects of patriarchy. First, um, how uh, women are conditioned into dependent behavior. One, how some women uh, support that behavior and oppress other women or how women oppress each other to please men in patriarchy. Third, um, how best to struggle against patriarchy, how best to resist it, overcome it. And fourth, how to be aware of the consequences of trying to break through gender norms, right? So if that's what her paper's about, that's four things. And so then she's got to start with the first one and go to the second one and go to the third one, right? Okay, and that's okay. And we'll see if she does that, right? Quoting from the Persephone, um, in addition to family dynamics, um, and again, she needed a specific text. I'm not sure what she's quoting from, right? So that's important. There's no reference there. There's a direct quote, but there's no reference. Um, okay. All right. So, um, so this is... This is difficult to follow. Our society regulates how to spend our lifespan with a dependent behavior. If one person is a woman, it's pretty inevitable with her. How a woman lives her life depends on public opinions or social perspective, just like Hecuba said. So starting next time, we're gonna start reading the tragedy. And I think I'm gonna do Hecuba um, so I'll, I'll assign that and I'll post it and all that stuff. But if she wants to say, just like Hecuba said, and there is a quote in the play, she doesn't quote it, right? Um, we're enslaved by public opinion. It's very hard. Um, okay. So, all right. So what she should have started this with? You know, her first point was going to be that uh, to explain how the dependent behavior develops. Then, right at the beginning of this paragraph, according to so and so, according to the article Victimization of Women, the scholar so and so, <laughs> whoever wrote it, said during childhood. Um, she should depend, I mean, she needs a context here. Um, the scholar says that adults tell young girls, quote, during childhood, she should depend on her father. All right, do you all understand that it's very hard? It's not well incorporated into the sentence. It just gets dropped in. Um, who's talking, she should depend, who's making this claim, whatever. And then it doesn't have the citation after the quote, right? So all of those things are problems. 
This paragraph should have started out. She had her four points she's going to show. Um, then you could say a scholarly article. She should cite who the scholar is based on research, you know, what research, and then quote, give the reference. Um, and it should be a sentence that's better incorporated. She has to incorporate this quote into some kind of context. Um, all right, so that's the first thing. Then, um, then her next point was over-dependence on male domination. So she did come into my office and we talked about this. So that's why, you know, she'll have each paragraph does follow the four points, but it, it, it needed a lot more work <laughs> within the paragraph and then the quotes and all this other stuff needed more work. The overdependence of male. Okay. Um, the overdependence of women on men leads many women to support the, um, well, to support men in their domination or to become quote unquote male identified women. They don't become supporters of male identified women. They become male identified women. Okay. Um, okay. And then she says, about half of the people in Bangladesh believe in these prejudices. Well, it would be nice to have a reference there. Because um, I'm not quite sure that that could just more than half. I, I don't think that that's just a common assumption, right? To say that men dominate is fine, like that's gonna all be agreed on. But if she says about half the people believe in some prejudices like this, she really needed some kind of support from some scholarship somewhere. <laughs> um, okay, then many of the superstitions have gradually been erased in the city's area. She needs data. For that, right? It's taking time to change rural people's mentality. That would, you can get data on that, right? There's lots of data about the difference between urban and rural attitudes. Um, and then she says, probably most women's mentalities is unchanged like that. <laughs> That's speculation without any support and you can find scholarly articles to support that. Um, okay, for example, many women are feeling pride if their husband and children can accomplish their careers. Um, I think it would be more reasonable to just say given that many women are not allowed to pursue their own um, careers, um, it makes sense to think that they instead encourage their husbands and their children to succeed where they cannot, something like that. But again, it would be good to have some kind of a, a reference to that. Um, all right. When they were brought up, they were taught, it does not matter for the housewives whether they're doing a job or not. But when they were brought up in their paternal or maternal home, they were taught the light of education. Um, I really don't know. I've lost the train of thought, right? Such types of women cannot stand upon their feet for the illusion of having male dominated identification which is the ideal perspective of society. Okay. Um, 
Okay. So I just, to me, this paragraph needs a lot of work or you just have to scrap it and figure out. You wanted a paragraph about how many women identify or embrace those prejudices against them. And then you'd have some research and then you'd have, but if you wanna do that, she doesn't have one quote from a scholarly article, right? That legitimizes that claim. Um, the women who break the barrier um, of gender, family, culture, religious norms, those can do jobs and keep pace with male dominations. Okay, <laughs> I think you need a paragraph saying some women do break those barriers and go on to achieve at a very high level. Then you'd need some research. This shows that the discrimination against women is wrong and unjust. So I think you should, that should be a whole paragraph. Women are proving these prejudices are wrong. Then you need another paragraph, another one of her main points. Um, when um, a certain percentage of women who do break the barriers become victims of harassment, right? That's another paragraph. It can be verbal, visual, physical, psychological. Um, even when she gets a promotion, sometimes her colleagues cannot tolerate it. They start gossiping. Well, wait a sec, you need some data, right? You never get data about gossiping. You might get data about how women who are promoted are resented. There might be research about that. Um, there are many documentaries on the harassment of women in the jobs. Well, you need to you need some data. You need to go get the name of the documentary, get some of the data uh, that's in the documentary. Um, all right, let's see. The women are not supposed to speak up. If one of them does, the society will fall, fall to. Uh, fall to find her fault. Um, okay, so these are all claims again that are just us. Uh, they're speculation, they're not reasonable. They're just keep going farther and farther from the last piece of data. Okay, so the first paper had data, 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 and then this would lead to the possibility of a downward spiral, right? This one is, there are many documentaries. Most of the stories remain in the darkness. You know, okay, I just have to believe you. They're not supposed to speak up. Okay, I'm supposed to believe you on them. If one of them does, the society will find fault. I'm supposed to believe you about that. Most of the people don't care. I'm supposed to believe you about that. People will start gossiping. I'm supposed to believe you about this. You know, all this stuff is like, I'm just supposed to believe this. We need some data. Um, okay, now this next example is, is one example. Now it's a good example, it's fine, but it's one example. You have to tie an example to the broader trend, right? That's very important because it's called anecdotal evidence. You can think of one example to disprove anything. Like Donald Trump is not sexist because he gave his first wife part of his business to run. So he's a he's a completely non-sexist guy. And he, you know, he's proud of his daughter who's a businesswoman. He's not sexist at all. Okay, guys, that's anecdotal evidence, right? And that's a lot of the stuff going on on social media. There will be one anecdote, there will be one example, but it will get used to refute 
mountains of data about overall cultural trends. And that's bad reasoning, very bad. You can't prove anything. You can't. I mean, there's lots of people who deny patriarchy because they say, well, there was a woman president in India, so India has no patriarchy. Or there was a woman prime minister and, you know, that's it. Like if there was one woman who, oh yeah, uh, there was uh, Benazir Bhutto, right? Headed Pakistan. So there's no problem with sexism in Pakistan. <laughs> Okay, that's anecdotal evidence, guys. You, you, if you think about it, no, that's not good reasoning. But anyway, so she's going to use this example. She was studying and the headmaster sexually harassed her. And according to a BBC News article, um, let's see, uh, choose to keep their experiences uh, for fear of being ashamed by society. Uh, this woman spoke out, she went to the police um, to file, and then she went to the police to, with uh, the help of her family on the day the alleged abuse happened. Then she went to the police to file a sexual harassment assault claim against the headmaster, but the police officer made fun of her situation, um, said it wasn't a big deal, um, after filing a complaint, they arrested him. The situation became worse for her after the arrest. Okay, so she's describing this. Um, but to me, the example is way too long, okay? She really needed to, um, okay, so here's a huge long paragraph. And what she needed to do was to explain, say her example represents a broader pattern of what happens when girls get harassed or assaulted and they report it, right? First of all, many of them don't report it because of social constraints or their parents discourage it. And you need some data. There's, I'm sure there's research on that. Second of all, this young woman did talk to her parents and they did go to the police. Third, many of them don't file to get the perpetrator arrested because they're afraid of what might happen. This woman did. And the thing that people are afraid of happened to her, right? Um, third, the police often do not support. So if you could get data about the police often do not follow through on these arrests. If you could get broader data on that and then say that was true in this case. Um, uh, some of her friends then, okay, the problem of women supporting patriarchy also came up in her case. These female friends um, started telling her she should withdraw the allegations. She refused. Then, then the women set her on fire, right? Okay, um, so she has a good example. It's just that she needs to break it down and show how each step in this one example is this much, much broader trend. That's, that's what she should have done with her example. Um, okay, in spite of all of this, um, uh, women's empowerment is a big deal in Bangladesh. People are speaking out. Um, another thing, if you want to talk about Bangladesh, in, in specifically, I did send you that New York Times article uh, by Nicholas Kristof, and he gives data about how Bangladesh has supported women, and it's really paid off. Um, I can scan that and send it 
I'll scan it and post it. But yeah, I mean, people in Bangladesh should feel somewhat proud, even though that I mean, you know, the the data about early marriages and all this stuff is horrible. The government, NGOs, there is a push. And that's why it's so great that AUW is definitely part of that. I think Brock, the Bangladesh um, world's largest NGO started in Bangladesh has always focused quite a bit on women. And I think actually it focused primarily on women. And that's really good. I, I actually have another article that I can give you about that. Uh, Mr. Fossil, the head, the guy who started it, they asked him, you know, what's the key to your success? And he said, well, I call in the women and I ask them their opinion. And that's, and that's how, that's why he's successful. So that was, that's really good. Um, so I will send you that if you want to use that as a reference. Um, all right, now, now, so I'll take questions. Does everybody understand how the first paper was way better than the second paper? Yes, Professor. Okay, so that would be the difference between an A paper and a C, right? Yeah. Okay, Is there any other questions? Because you can read through any of these papers and then you can, I mean, we'll read through another one if you like. Uh, all the topics are interesting. It's just the quality of a paper as a paper and learning how to prove, learning how to make point by point. I also think personally, people can live better lives. It, women can, if they can literally filter their experience through this system and they can figure out which part of the system has got them caught, you know, and they can talk to their friends. And so they're not just giving anecdotes, right? Because once you start saying, oh, that's outrageous what happened to this friend, it's outrageous. I mean, just cut it, cut it and get it back to the system. Like, which part of the system is this? And if you understand it, it gives you character strength, right? It gives you strength because you know, this isn't your problem. You're getting blamed for it. You're suffering for it, but it's not your problem. And they're wrong and you're right. So I do think this process of writing a good paper is also good for character development. Okay. Any other, um, we have 20 more minutes and I'm gonna stop for a good 30 seconds or so to make sure anybody has a question and then I'll go back to another paper um, to use the time. But let me just stop for a minute. Um, professor, do we need to choose the context um, of our country or we can write about women like everywhere in the world, kind of like that? Actually, good question. Um, if you notice the one in psychology really didn't differentiate, right? Okay. Yeah. Whereas the one, the second one completely was Bangladesh. So that I'm completely uh, neutral on that. You might want to start with the more general and then do your specific country. Whereas that the second paper that did, just did Bangladesh would have been a lot stronger if she would have said in this example, this happened, right? She did report it. She did um, take it, uh, bring a lawsuit. She did get killed by her female, you know, friends. So, if that had also been, this isn't just in Bangladesh, right? This is a much bigger problem. And if there had been research on, it happens throughout the developing countries or something like that, it would have been a stronger uh, paper. 
because she had a good example. It's just that you have to show that this example is an archetype. It's like when you were, um, you know, if you had a friend and you said, well, he's Hermes because of ABC. Well, you really need to read the archetype, right? You really need to read the book first before you start just taking this person in, right? So she just took this one example and showed stuff, but she needed to show that this really, these are broad patterns in patriarchy. Okay, thank you, Professor. I understand. The other point always is that if throughout the world, the difference between urban and rural is big, tends to be big. Um, and that's true in the US too. <laughs> Any other questions? Because that, that's a good question. And I think you probably have some good questions. Well, OK, so I'll take another one to just show you. Um, let's see. Um, we had a diplomat, someone who wants to to uh, this, some of the other, I think some of my students know Rotana and she grew up in Cambodia and she got pressured to choose STEM related, but she wants to be a diplomat. So there, <laughs> um, so she didn't have, um, so anyway, that was that one. The one I'm thinking that I wanted to use, oh, this one. Um, this is where she, she came in with some of these archetypes, which is fine. So she said, I'm really like the goddess Athena and my grandfather inspired me to be a businesswoman. So that's great. That's a great way to start it. You don't have to, right? The psychology paper didn't refer to archetypes, but you certainly can. Um, it would be good, she, she should have quoted, right? And had a reference here. Athena is the goddess would definitely that comes straight out of the book. So that needed a quote and a reference. Uh, my grandfather's inspired me. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so again, she, she needed to, to get more organized, right? Um, she could have started with describing the Athena archetype. Um, this is what she's good at. She also tends to defend patriarchy. Uh, and then, then the next section would be, my grandfather inspired me um, to become that. Let's see. All right. Okay, so each sentence is relevant, but I think it needs to be organized differently. Let's see. Um, all right. All right. So first section, Athena archetype, then they, the women in business tend to be this type. Then they also tend to defend the patriarchy because they tend to do well in that system. All right, next section. My grandpa inspired me. He was a businessman. I want to be a businesswoman. Um, uh, Let's see, she should say something like, um, I don't wanna be a businesswoman who marginalizes other women. You know, she, she should say something like, after reading about all the goddesses, I want to make sure that I'm a good Athena, but I don't judge or marginalize other women. And then she could say something like, um, today, uh, there's been a significant growth in not only in the number of women entrepreneurs,
but in the number of women who are pursuing their archetypes in all sectors of society. Um, so this paper, however, is going to focus on the rise of women in businesses. Does that make sense? Y'all? So you start out with the Athena archetype. She tends to protect the patriarchy. My grandpa inspired me. He was a businessman. I, I anticipate that I will be an Athena type businesswoman. After reading the goddesses, however, I will not marginalize other women. Uh, and this paper is going to focus on women in business. Is that, so that would be the best way, I think. In my country, um, girls are, are considered housekeepers, child bearers, and vision carriers for their other half, right? For men, their better half, you could say it's considered. Um, society thinks education is only for men. Um, okay. All right, so I think the first sentence here should be the first obstacle for women who want to go into business is that they need to have a good education. And then she would have how patriarchy cripples women from getting a good education, right? Um, then the next point is that a lot at the, at the moment, there's a, a huge emergence of women in micro businesses because they can run these businesses from home, right? And then she could have a sentence about that, right? And you could say, Okay, number one, the problem is education. Number two, um, there has been this emergence of women in businesses that consists of selling things that they do at home. On the one hand, they're, they get good at these things. And on the other hand, they don't need that much higher education to be able to market them and sell them. Okay, so, um, ah, so she has another point, okay, of she grew up watching housewives quarrel with their husbands over money. That's another point. Now, um, she, you know, that's a fine point. It's just you have to figure out how it would fit in the argument. So women are not given education. Women are at home. They do develop good skills at home. They also, when they cannot make any money, they are in a subservient position. So it makes sense that they would have started creating these micro businesses. And right, so that would be a, a more reasonable way order to uh, present the material. Um, all right, so here's a quote. And I, I don't think this fits very well into the her paper, okay? Because what she's talking about are these micro businesses and not having to depend on their husbands. But the quote says women run 40% of firms of all sizes. Okay, women of color account for 64% African-Americans, Latinas, and Asians. This, it really, I, I mean, it sounds to me like America, right? <laughs> um, state of women-owned businesses. It really sounds like the data is talking about American women. Because why would they just talk about African Americans, Latinas, and Asians? You know, uh, so that would be my guess. 
And um, it doesn't really, I don't think it supports that much. Her point here is just that women are stuck at home, that they don't like not having money and that they are creating these businesses. But I think it's just a big jump to this particular quote. Um, all right, because a lot of these businesses, women do have to have a, a shop outside of the home. They have to borrow money. Um, it, it does tend to be, even small businesses are more complicated than just having something literally running out of your home. Um, oh, let's see. Okay, so she also wants to talk about Aphrodite and Demeter. Um, and that's fine, okay? I think, um, I think a separate paragraph about Demeter would be good. Um, she treats her business like her child, and that's good. I mean, that's a nice analogy. You could also say that in these micro businesses, a lot of the things that they make are related to being mothers. They know what kids like to play with, or they know about, you know, special uh uh, they know how to make backpacks, cheap backpacks to carry babies on your back. Or they know how to make these things to wrap so that you can nurse your baby while you're doing something else. Or I mean, just something where there's all this stuff women are making because they're, they're moms and they know what would sell, what a mother would buy. So that's another, you know, you just brainstorm. If you're going to talk about Demeter, let's think of all the dimensions of it. This is a good one, right? She treats her business like her baby. Um, and then the thing about Aphrodite, um, and that would be a whole nother paragraph. And it's good. What's the troublesome, troublemaking goddess Aphrodite got to do with it, right? Um, She's confident, speaking, interacting. Um, she's, yeah, so she could convince people. She can be a vision carrier. She can um, connect to these, uh, how the inspire, okay. These women inspire young girls. So they can be vision carriers for young girls. And then she gives examples, right? Most of the rest of her paper is examples, and that's fine um, as long as, you know, it fits in with all the other stuff. So, so that was, that's probably enough. Let me take a minute here for questions. Okay, so the reading for next time, we're going to have three class days reading a Greek tragedy. So, so far we've just been doing the, the archetypes. Now we're gonna look at how human beings react to each other um, and all the gender stuff that goes on. And um, I'll ask you to I think what I'm going to do is have you just write one post for all three of the classes that we do on the tragedy. So you get a little bit of a break one week because I do want you to be start researching your paper. Um, and so we're going to go back to looking at Aristotle's that list of virtues and vices. How is it that the women or the men are or are not exhibiting, well, mostly the vices, frankly, but but just to get you, to give you what I just would like you to read, read it and pick out a few things. I guess I do want you to pick out something so we can start out with, well, what did you pick out from the 
from the tragedy, but it is a little off-putting just to all of a sudden pick up something and read. But um, it is about Hecuba. It's after the Trojan War. Her daughter, um, okay, her son Paris stole Helen, stole another guy's woman, and came over to Troy. This is her son and her husband let them in to the city and protected them. And the Achaeans came and destroyed Troy. So now she's with, she is a slave of a war slave. She's coming back with Agamemnon. She has her daughter and her handmaids. And um, now Achilles, now um, Odysseus is claiming that Achilles in Hades wants to have her daughter as his virgin in Hades. So they're gonna kill her daughter. So the main point there that I want you to notice is how noble her daughter is. Her daughter is the hero of the story. She's the one who uses the word freedom. You check out how she uses the word freedom because the play is about how everybody thinks of freedom, what they're free to do and what they're not free to do. So you can just if you just want to focus on Polyzena and how incredibly noble she is, you might want to point out that, gee, I thought the Greeks were, you know, were sexist. But look, this playwright has this incredibly high quality woman uh, who's living the absolutely best life. So the poets are trying to get people to think critically. Like, get over your sexism. It's wrong. So I guess that's what I would want. If you, you know, if you need some direction, if you see other things in there, but just that idea, remember with Delphi, that poets want you to think critically. They want you to question. They want you to question your sexism, question your customs of making women into sex slaves. Your custom of Agamemnon has brought Cassandra, her other daughter, she's his sex slave. They're questioning this use of women as uh, power, you know, for showing men showing other men how powerful they are. All these really horrible sexist customs are being questioned. So I guess I, that would be one thing I'd like you to pick out and then see what else the rest of you might come up with. But I will not grade anything, any notes that you sort of jot down. You don't even have to hand them in. You could write notes after the class is over. OK? I got to let you go now. So I'll wait here if anybody has other questions. Professor, I don't have any question yet. I think. OK. Thank you, Professor. Sure, and if any of you want to go over specifically any of those papers, like step by step, right, just to get in your mind what it means to write a good paper, I'm happy to do that. This is a writing seminar. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor. Of course. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Of course. So Rook Nine, I'm glad you made it today. And Jana Tool, I'm glad that you made it to class today. Oh, I guess I better shut this off.